All right, so it's my pleasure to introduce Bei uh, Wang, uh, who will speak to us on uh, geometric inference using uh, kernel density estimates. So, um, joint work with uh, Jeff, and uh, he's a PhD student in Yen, as of Utah. Um, for the first 20 minutes, I'm going to give a more compact overview of the work, and the remaining of the time, depending on how much time we have, I'm going to go into a little bit technical detail, uh, not much, um, but feel free to interrupt me at any time. Um, so I'm going to give a relatively casual talk on this topic. Okay, measure inference and consistency estimate. So of course, oops. Uh, what do we call geometric inference? I'm sure most of the people here are familiar with the concept, but I'm going to define it anyway. Um, essentially, geometric inference is in addition where you have unknown object, for example, usually we assume it's a compact set um, in RD, and you also have a finite point cloud P sampled from the set under some sort of process. What geometric inference, in my opinion, is to recover some form of topological or geometric property of the unknown object from its point sample. For example, recover number of components, dimensions, um, such as those are the homological information, and maybe something geometrical such as uh, such as curvature. Um, and then we also uh, some sort of reconstruction so that uh, reconstruction we obtain from the point cloud um, curves homeomorphism. Uh, homotopy type, homology. I think we focus here is to have reconstruction or inference that serve uh, homotopy equivalence, uh, which means basically two spaces can be deformed completely to one another. Um, the following I just pick up an uh, example that um, in original Shizak's work in uh, distance to a measure, where on the left is a sample of with noise on the right is some form of re reconstruction based on points sample. Typically when we're doing uh, geometry inference, the, um, the use is uh, what we call um, distribution, which in this example we have two, uh, we have a point sample sampled from a fade with noise. And um, the, the fundamental question is can we reconstruct approximation of this underlying object by an offset on cloud. And by offsets, some, some we interpret it as union of force. For example, in the distance function, a point cloud P is defined as I was listed here, which is infimum of, of a location of uh, the distance of a point in space to the closest point in my point sample. Uh, offset, uh, which is like fattening of the point cloud, is equal to the sublevel set of distance function to the point cloud. Today we describe um, the, dis um, the differences between the set as well as the, um, with respect to the underlying object, a way to measure the sample quality, and one of the typical measure is uh, the Hausdorff distance, which is basically defined as um, the infimum of the distance function with respect to point cloud and distance function with respect to the object itself. Another way to understand how stroke distance is typically the following, where at maximum phase, then the object is included in an epsilon fattening of the point cloud, and the point cloud is included in the epsilon fattening of the object itself. Um, some of the typical results coming from distance-based inference. Um, for example, if my hostel distance between my object and my sample is very small, then distance to the sample and the distance to the object are close, and subsequently that the slightly fattening object any of the point cloud should carry same topology information at some appropriate scale. And then in this particular example of reconstruction theorem, um, has an extradition 
of a uh, uh, sort of lower bound over the reach of the compact set uh, with such uh, sort of geometric constraint and some sort of bounds on the whole stroke distance, then claim that with certain appropriately chosen threshold that the thickening of the object and the thickening of the point cloud uh, will be equivalent. One way to understand this sort of result is that sort of constraint on the reach of the object ensures some form of nice topological property associated with the object itself. And sampling quality um, can, be, can be considered as some sort of density measure with respect to the sample. Okay. This is another example actually come up from the original discussion about distance to a measure. Typical distance function based geometric inference is not very robust to outliers. Which means that in this particular example, if, if my object itself comes, um, is consists of a large, nice object plus extra point in some distance away, the based inference method may fail because um, it's it's become um, the distance to this big object versus the distance to the entire object can be very far away as well. So not much of a stability with respect to um, those distance functions. Another solution that is proposed by Chazelle in 2011 is consider a dislike function specific design so that it's robust to noise. And for them to robust to noise, um, such distance functions have a set of desirable properties um, so that they are extremely useful in, of, uh, in geometric inference. Um, they are robust to noise. Number one condition is that such function should be uh, one lepton, which is defined affination. And the thing is that the square of such function should be semi-concave, which means that the square minus norm should be concave. Final definition is that it has to be proper, which I'll go into detail, a little bit detail later, which essentially means that as my Infinity, this dislike function um, goes to infinite of its domain. For example, goes to infinity. Uh, this condition, I mean, the distance like function to be Lepschitz ensures that this function is uh, differentiable almost everywhere, and uh, and 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 the mean axis of the underlying object has zero d volume. And the second part, the semi-concave property is a little bit crucial in a sense, in, it's very useful in proving the existence of the flow of the distance function for topological inference. We'll see using this properly later. Okay, overview of what I mean by kernel. Our kernel is a similarity measure um, that takes a pair of points in R and I of non network in this particular case, uh, we focus on Gaussian kernel, um, and it's you know one property of it is a is a positive definite. So uh, the Gaussian kernel between two points P and X is falling form, and in particular we use this this structure here because it gives us nice constant later in the proof. Of course, which has this nice infinite support. Uh, there's other typical kernel people consider, for example, triangle kernel and kernel with those falling shapes. But we see that actually all the property we prove uh, very nice for Gaussian kernel and it's for triangle or ball kernel because of, uh, uh, um, because of the, the semi, uh, the positive definite property associated with Gaussian kernel. Um, okay, so got, what's kernel density estimate? Um, uh, for a discrete point at P, a kernel estimate, X is basically the sum of all the contribution coming from all points in the point set and normalized by the size of point set. And here is an example uh, where my point set is on R and I have a Gaussian kernel operating on each 
each point P in those. And the, the shape of here is basically how the kernel density estimate looks like in one dimension. But of course, this is a, on top, this is a discrete case. In the sort of continuous case, we can assume there's a measure on domain so that my kernel density estimate takes sort of the following integral form. Okay, so the distance between two points set PQ is really defined is based on some sort of similarity measure between two points set. So if I go to define kernel distance, let me first define similarity between two points set. So cut between two points set P and Q is basically the sum of kernels operating on pairwise from two sets normalized by their um, And then one point set is actually a single point. Then the similarity measure between a point set P and point X is basically the kernel density estimate at this location at, with respect to point set P. So, for example, I have a point set P that's red and a point set Q that's blue, and they're both on the line. Um, what happens is that now every point from point set P has a Gaussian kernel operating on it. And, and a point um, on the be able to evaluate pairs with the range in, uh, in P. That's what happened. Usually, the similarity measure is a sum of all these influences from one point set to another. Um, now, the important definition to keep in mind is what we call kernel distance, which turns out to be a metric between two points set. If the thing. So therefore, the distance being a point set P and point set Q is it seems is basically kappa PP plus kappa QQ minus two times kappa PQ. This basically means it's self similarities at and there's cross similarities between two point sets. Now, everything talking so far is in sort of the discrete setting. In the continuous setting, we have following form, where again, the similarity measure between two measures defined on the domain is going to be this integral form. And distance, again, will become a metric between two measures and square root of cell similarity minus cross similarity. Assume that if one of the measures um, the unit Dirac mass, the kernel, the similarity between a measure and a point is the equivalent to kernel density estimate at that point with measure. And then if we look a little bit deeper, we can take the following form. If I have fixed my measure and I fix my kernel, then I can put a kernel distance of a with respect to a measure and sort of a square root of a constant which depend on the measure itself, my two times currency estimate at this point. point. Distance is, used, um, is defined um, also called a current distance or maximum mean discrepancy. And then some kernel distance is a metric of its characteristic. And characteristic is essentially a slight restriction of being positive definite. So, for example, both Gaussian plus kernels are characteristic kernels which make distance be a metric. So message of one of number one is that with geometric inference from a point cloud be calculated by examining its kernel density estimate with respect to Gaussian kernel. And made possible with multiple properties the vehicle of kernel distance. Um, clearly, um, the super level set of kernel density estimate corresponds to the sub level set of kernel distance. And such inference is robust and uh, with respect to noise and is scalable. And then finally, provide algorithm to add the topology of kernel distance using weighted RIPS complex. 
is, is a picture example of the, the level set of kernel density estimate. Okay, a little bit more detail. Um, to geometric inference using kernel distance, um, we basically prove similar properties of this kernel distance uh, compared to distance to a measure that is proposed by Giselle in 2011. Um, kernel distance has the following properties. It's just, um, and in particular, it's distance-like, meaning that it's lepchets, it's one lepchets, it's one sequence concave, it's proper and stable. Um, and first, we claim that it has a small corset construction, and there is a separate paper that shows that um, you said for um, coming from 100 million points, and you can construct the corresponding distance kernel density estimate and still enjoy nice properties. The we first uh, kernel density estimate is a super level set of kernel density estimate corresponds to the sub level set of distance. Have some of them that can approximate the sub level set filtration of kernel distance in some point cloud sample. So, so far, why do you even care about kernel distance? Sorry, babe, can I interrupt yes. you? Yes. Uh, can you tell us what the co co is? Oh, okay. Coset. Uh, oh, for that. Yeah. Coset. Okay. Yeah. Coset is basically a uh, sampling of the point set with certain nice properties. A uh, vague description. There's various algorithms to construct smaller subset of points um, that preserve certain properties, and they are uh, called core sets. So, coarse sets. Something like that. Okay. Um, so the reason I want to emphasize why do we even care about all this construction is because people love and are familiar with kernel density estimate. People play with Gaussian kernel all the time. Right? We believe the kernel distance itself is a prop connection between kernel density estimate and um, geometric inference. Example: I have. My sign object, which is a lot, which is actually the empty sign, is a uh, circle intersecting with a line. And then there is sort of 70% uh, of those points set is actually noise. And I'm using a pretty wide uh, uh, or threshold for the Gaussian kernel. So my color here is basically the super level set of kernel density estimate based on this sample with a fixed threshold kernel. Again, if I name sample quality, but I'm gonna make my Gaussian kernel a little bit sharper, this is the corresponding behavior of super level set of the kernel density estimate. As you can see that as I'm changing the threshold, the super level set of a kernel density estimate actually um, approximates the underlying geometric shape. An example where I'm making my um, or even sharper or narrower, and this is how the super level set looks like. Okay. So now this is sort of my quick overview talk about, you know, if we're not going into any technical detail, we expect. Um, essentially, the take-home message is that anything you can do with um, this like um, function-based inference, kernel, di uh, kernel distance, or kernel density estimate is a vehicle because it's rich noise. So, detail, I will review quickly the distance measure, which one of the, I consider one of the first work that considers distance-based inference that is robust to noise. So then proposed by Chazelle in 2011, um, the intuition behind distance to a measure is that I have a measured mu on a compact set and uh, my distance to a measure is um, some form of distance to certain fraction of the space. The actual definition of distance to a measure takes a relatively complex form, but what that boils down to is the distance to a measure evaluated at a certain point x 
is for integral or weighted integral uh, much mass um, a ball of certain radius could include as radius shrinks or expands. But it turns out that um, tensor measure has nice uh, um, is close to um, our understanding of case neighbor. So I'm not into the technical detail of this, but one main contribution coming from this work is to say that uh, distance measure has a nice property that is distance like, which is one shed, it's one semi concurve, it's per, and it's stable. In particular, their stability result is the following is that two distance measure are closed. E corresponding measures are close. The, me the closeness between the measure is measured by uh, Washer's type 2 distance. Sure, the stability quality associated with kernel distance is actually uh, different, but still we consider nice enough to claim nice properties. So, what's up? Recall that uh, the distance, kernel distance the sort of measure setting is equal to a tent with respect to the measure minus two times kernel density, uh, kernel density estimate at that point and taking the square root of it. And if I have the point cloud setting, then the kernel distance with respect to the point cloud is again a constant minus two times kernel density estimate at point. So we spend a lot of time proving that this particular form of kernel distance is also distance-like, meaning that it's lepchitz, it's semi-concave, it's proper, and it's stable. So one thing I need to full pay a special attention to is this property condition. Um, so, the, so recall the previous slides. Keep in mind this is a form of my distance. So what I'm defining is a continuous map between topological space is proper inverse image of every compact subset in the, um, in the range is compact in the domain. It means that for every sequence of P in X that is to infinity, the corresponding function value associated with this sequence is, escapes in infinity in Y. So we show these that kernel distance is proper, but what's most in interesting is the corollary following this is to say the super level set of density estimate for all ranges bigger than compact. So the way you can imagine this is you take a point set, you look at the kernel density estimate, and you look at the super level set above the threshold that's above zero, then those super level sets should be compact. Intuitive, but it takes a while to actually show it's true. It's coming from kernel distance two of the reconstruction theorem associated with it. The one, the isotopy lemma on kernel distance is that basically that if there is an interval, let's say the kernel distance has nickel points within. The top level set associated with those interval are isotopic, meaning they can uh, form to one another through a continuous path. The same, um, a very simpler version is that if the two measures defined with respect to a kernel distance are close, then the level sets of kernel distance are homotopy equivalent. Form, which is two kernel distance are close in the infinity sense, and with certain constraint on um, the reach of the function, the um, global set between two kernel distance are um, be equivalent. The app is essentially how to uh, construct topological estimates using all this. And I have a quick image of. We typically call the Veritoris Rips complex, which basically for a point set, you form a simplex for every finite set of points that 
these and most are away. Takes the following form. It's a technical, but if we have time, we'll go into the extra slides towards the end of the talk. But actually, the results said that if I, have, if I construct some form of weighted ribs filtration based on point set, set the bottleneck distance log version of the bottleneck distance between my um, between my kernel distance and then between um, and the bottle distance uh, uh, and the that persistent diagram. Sorry, the bottleneck distance between the persistent diagram associated with my kernel distance and the persistent diagram associated with my ribs complex is at this is far apart. I'm pretty sure this constant isn't tight, but we just see there is an upper bound, so, but it could be possibly further tightened. The problem is basically try to approximate the person diagram of the sub-level sets filtration of the kernel distance in what we use as weighted ribs filtration and all the sort of technical details is coming from the work by Bachizel Odol and um, she in 2015, which is what we call or what they call a power distance construction. So time I'll go into that detail later. So uh, Cukes the weighted ribs filtration again. I yes. think you I think you did, but I missed it. Oh, okay. So um the pre slide. Yeah, actually in order to explain that I was I'm going to jump to the very end because um I have pretty much slides designed for this. Um, so first of all so first of all you have if you have a power distance, right? If you have metric space set in the in the space a function which is a you consider as some form of weight, then is um, is associated with the point set with the weight is the following. So it seems like power diagram and things like that. So what's complex? So I'm sorry, uh, yeah, you can check complex for point set P with weight. Is the simplest is such that the union of the ball at this particular R parameter is not zero. So actually your radius of your ball changes with respect to your weight. About a union of balls of uniform weight, you talk about a union of balls with varying weight. Oh, well, sorry, what varying radius? And radius is related to your weight in the following sense. The ribs complex. Basically, the ones uh, corresponding to uh, their complex, once it's corresponding to the check complex. So it's the rib complex corresponding to this check complex version. Okay. Thanks. Right. Your contacts are the weight come from the measure? Yes. Yeah, yes. Yeah. So. The algorithm itself is a it's pretty much a 20 minutes talk by itself. So at time I will go towards the end. But the idea is essentially is how um to the current distance in this sort of weighted construction. Actually here, this version of it. There are several versions of it, and I do claim that I don't think the construction we have so far is the cleanest construction. And I'm also open for suggestions as how you use the weight in the language of kernel distance. But what we end up doing is that if you see before, weight comes in with with a predefined weight point, and where our weight comes in, the weight basically has to do with the with the distance at that point. Exactly one of the trick we did in the algorithm construction. Is really the weight in the power distance, where the distance. Back. Oh, the full property is that the kernel distance would uh, that kernel distance approximate the distance, the traditions with some nice threshold. 
So what we mean here is that suppose, again, my mu is a uniform measure defined on the compact set, and mu k is my kernel distance, and s is my distance to the support of mu, which is the additional then that on certain conditions, the kernel distance approximates the distance to the object itself in sense. Some constraints on each of space that of current at certain threshold, sub lower set of my distance function at certain threshold also be equivalent. And then, thanks to discussion with Yusu, that the idea would be give any flow line gamma associated with the generalized gradient function. Kernel distance is a monotonic increase a for points that is sufficiently far away from the axis object itself. Is that within this range that the, the behavior associated with the kernel distance is the is the same? It's basically well, sorry, the, or is that the different measure behaves relatively nicely as it's flowing along the kernel distance function when similar far away from the media access. And to show later to see how that how actually they approximate each other. Maybe I should show it now. So here is a it's actually towards the very end of my slide. This is the actual example of how you understand relation between um, kernel distance and distance. So if my distance is just a distance a distance with respect to my origin then my distance function um, it follows this particular line. As you move away, your distance goes away. The half of the distance function goes around here. So the distance, um, sorry, uh, sorry, let me change it back. This here is a distance over two, this thing is, is distance itself, and then in the middle is the kernel distance between, between x and zero. And then the three curves here correspond to the kernel distance with different um, pressure associated with the kernel. So as that there is a range where I can choose appropriate threshold for my kernel where my kernel distance is nested between, um, between, between the distance function. This is in some nice ranges here and here and here, the kernel distance almost behaves similar as its um, distance function. But with, for example, lost noise and things like that. Okay, going back. back. Okay, the property is to say that in certain nice ranges, the distance behaves similarly as distance function to the object. Okay, probability results, this is one, the basic result is basically saying that if I have two kernel distance defined over two different measures, then the infinity distance is upper bounded by kernel distance between those two measures. The second property is unexpected for us is that there's no Lipschitz constant such that for any two measure that the largest type two distance is bounded by this gamma times kernel distance between them. What really mean is that we had the watch type do distance and actually can grow actually big between two uh, mirror and, and those sort of leptious constraint to those two. And I'm in the detail of the special case, but essentially, when one of the measure is a direct mass, I show that are provided by washes distance for um, any for the when the kernel 
parameter is bigger than zero. But this is sort of a special case. We have a why it's necessarily extremely useful, but it's just a property to have. Uh, now, we actually about kernel distance, is that it has a specific, a specific stability property with respect to sigma. When I'm, I'm fixing a location, uh, a location x, and I'm varying my, uh, my parameter associated with my kernel, which in this case is the bandwidth of the kernel. So with that kernel distance is ellipsis with respect to um, um, the bandwidth parameter and for a particular constant that is less than six. And you consider essentially the bandwidth uh, or the darkness of the Gaussian kernel as, as a geometric notion of form of outlier parameter is how much you kind of smooth out the underlying noise. But we the kernel distance is sort of has a nice lepsis condition with respect to um, this particular parameter. Um, one of the advantages say that we can construct or compute current or constant estimate with small set that leads to very efficient computation. Advantage is that because kernel the sub level set of uh, kernel distance enjoys all the nice property of the sub level set of distance function, and in addition to being um, lost to noise, then um, we can use the sub level set of kernel distance to do inference. And with its relation with kernel density estimate, that also means that we can do geometric inference by looking at the super level set of kernel density estimate. By coset. So the result is to say that if I have point set P, I find a, a sort of constant, and I can find a small set, which is a subset of the point set P, which is Q, which is which is what I call an epsilon coset, so that the kernel distance between those two are close. Bounding their density estimates are also close with probability. Had some results in previous years to show basically the size of this of this epsilon coset. One of the most simple construction of coset is actually construct a random sample of the set P. And if you do random sample, then the epsilon coset size um, is this bounds. Have experimental evidence of how to construct this coset with 10 million points. No, 100 points. Some property that came nicely is that if I compute the, the persistent diagram of density estimate of the original set and the persistent diagram of the kernel density estimate of the core set, then the net distance is also operated by the quality of my core set. So uh, in actual computation, if you want to Code persistent diagram um, with certain controlled noise model, they can, I might as well do it with your call set. So here, the black point is my original set, and the red point is my call set. Of course, another emphasize because the relation between kernel distance and constant estimate, then perform geometric inference looking at the super level set. Of constancy estimate. The property is is kernel distance is monotonic with respect to kernel density estimate. That is, as kernel distance gets smaller, kernel density estimate gets larger. And this is a clean, natural interpretation that connects those two concepts together. Okay, experiments I want to show is actually using the most recent TDA package for R. Um, it is, um, I think, it's, but it's not published somewhere. But the software is available, and they already have uh, in the computation of kernel distance in that page itself. So example where I have, again, 10K points in a square, 
where the noise, uh, where I have a certain noise model and 25% of those points are outliers. Left is basically the, um, the of distance. And then in the middle is basically the persistent diagram associated with the traditional distance function to the point set. As you see, there's a lot much of uh, useful information because link thing corresponding to what they call a confidence interval. So there's not much of a, a no features use additional distance function because it's not robust to noise. But if you were going to use kernel distance, you were able to recover the, the thirds of this, this shape, which corresponding to like here, they're responding to the two um, high persistence circles. we show is basically I use the original data set and this is a kernel distance oh sorry this is this is density estimate diagram uh, with the oral data set uh, on the right is basically if I were going to construct a call set which is only around a thousand point and it's sort of the corresponding persistent diagram associated with a call set however the only the thing here that's not very nice is because there's two topological features which correspond into the two um, the holes in here actually the confidence interval is that in terms of the software itself assumes the data is sampled ID. However, in typical coset algorithms, the, the coset construction is not sampling ID from the set itself. So I think this is up for further invent is how do you construct nine core set so that you also maintain the kind of interval that you're interested in. So computer directions, of course. One is that um, there's a what distance to a measure is. It's very closely related to kernel uh, near per kernel, and the distance in some sense is a generalization that you generalize to a larger class of kernels that not include not only include Gaussian and possibly Laplace because all the properties that we we show that work for Gaussian kernel would probably work for Laplace kernel. For example, uh, however, triangle or board kernel we believe that they may work in practice, but they don't have Properties as enjoyed by Gaussian kernel. Something to, for, uh, useful for further investigation. But essentially, we be by looking through kernels, um, we can look at a large class of dislike functions for um, parametric inference. For example, of your alternative kernels. And looking at kernel density estimate of those uh, of those functions. This example of the same data set using Laplace kernel, and this using triangle kernel, and using the what I call E kernel, and this is finally using Bohr kernel. And what we claim is that alpha shape could be probably considered as, as using Bohr kernel, uh, the following parameter setting. As you see that it's not exactly it's not nice looking with a kernel for inference. Um, all the kernels put next together. And I know a very, very interesting question, which I think is um, challenging, but it would be nice if we could make progress towards this direction. If you're looking at a kernel distance or even you look at kernel density estimate, there's two parameters. One is the parameter R, which corresponds to the I level or sub level set threshold was the parameter sigma corresponding to the bandwidth of the kernel or some sense of uh, um, smoothing parameter. Both can be used to control the scale. So usually this corresponds to some sort of muscular persistence or scale space persistence. The most interesting question is how do you choose the right parameter or how do you choose the right pair between the parameter? What we here is actually example where on the left, I'm showing the uh, both of them. I'm showing the sub-level set for the kernel distance. But on the left, I'm fixing.
exceeding the threshold of my kernel and varying my sub-level set. On the right, I'm actually fixing my sub-level set threshold, and I'm, I'm actually varying my bandwidth of kernel. As you see, we are a little bit careful, so we actually choose pairs of parameters so that they give almost identical visual effect. But there's still minor differences between these two. But you it's there are my nice parameter selection um, with those two parameters. So that's it. And the acknowledgement for creation with Dung, um, Chiselle, and ERA group. Um, and then also, they do YouTube for discussion on geometry reconstruction. Talk. And for questions, and uh, if people are curious, but I don't know if I have time, but I have all the details associated with the algorithms if we went to that. I just want you to. Uh, so, do we have any questions? Sorry. <laughs> do we have any questions okay. today? Fashion. <laughs> uh. So, example where um, your sense to value of X and you have different um, current distance estimates with different choices of standard deviation. And oh, you told me the last slides. This no, no. The, the slides where you, you plot the absolute value of X and the absolute value of X over oh, two. That's the last one. Okay, yeah, this one. Exactly. Yeah. And um, so then, the, uh, um, when the standard deviation is the largest, that gives the estimate in a particular example. But, yeah. in, but in more complicated examples, you don't know which their deviation choice is going to give you the best. Yeah, so, so that's a good question because that's sort of what I'm trying to lean in towards too, towards the last page. This is a, a very simple example of right. understanding the function because I don't have one point. Right. Um, you have a uh, you know a giant point set. Nice property associated with uh, kernel distance within a particular threshold, right? But but what is the sort of the best parameter setting? My, I don't know. I think it's probably problem problem deep data dependent. A part of it, it would be a very nice question to how to choose those properties, uh, parameters. To have the best approximation, so that I do not know. Mm -hmm. Like I said, we have some results to show that within certain range, that um, the current distance restricted to the generalized gradient with respect is monotonic. So you, along that line, you can you can construct deformation retract. So those you know, but the question is that where is a parameter setting. I do, and I think part of it is that it's also driven by, for example, later earlier I also mentioned about things like cost to subsampling and using kernel density estimate based on subsamples. Other steps, the question of how or you lose certain nice inference properties or instance confidence intervals. You may still be able to pick out the topological uh, features, but then the confidence became sort of you're you less and less confident about what you can infer. Thanks. From the T point of view, you maybe want to do like multi-dimensional persistence on these two uh, parameters. Yes, and and an even very simple experiment I think is that. Like, like the picture I was trying to show, which is very nice, is that there is evidence that there's a very different combination of parameters that, you know, in this case, this is like, this is filtration along sub-level sets. This is a filtration along the bandwidth parameter. And then you can see those sort of almost identical, but not exactly identical um, of filtration. Um, I don't know. And be able to, to maybe study the dimensional filtration or actually not 
that liquid filtration. But to be able to study two-dimensional persistence would be really nice. And in this particular case, this is a natural setting where persistence will come to play, I think. Questions? So for, for that distance-like definition, one of the properties that you want is that it's semi-concave. Yes. Uh, can you give an intuition as to either property is or why you would want a distance-like function to have that property? Well, I think I kind of lure to it a little bit. Um, it was used if I if I is still fresh. Um, Okay, let's get to there. Hold on, let me go back to that slide. So, so all thing is that the use in this isotopy lemma, lemma that we have later, but essentially when when this when when one semi concave I must I must say that I don't I don't think this is semi concave is a technical definition, but much rather I understand it as to say that square minus this is a concave. Um, but actually what this means that there exists uh, some form with the function itself. So there exists a nice definition of the flow a lot gradient of this function. So the property itself is used inherently, I believe, in the isotopy uh, lemma that we have later. So it's like sort of, it's not exactly obvious, but it's used in the proof itself to uh, the isotopy lemma. Right here. That's what I say about it. You mentioned there is a number of algorithms for constructing the core set. Yes. Any particular simple one you could? Yeah, the simplest one is actually a random sample. Right, P, and I take a random sample. But as you can see, that actually there is a slide that shows the shows the complexity. So I has work a lot on this area, and the same thing with. Uh, Gosh, I think there's a, and Pankaj Agarwal has always, has worked a lot. And then the definition of closest is kind of, in my understanding, is sort of loose because um, essentially you, all you want to do is constructing a subsampling of your point set that preserves certain properties. So you say it's a close set, it just means, you know, it's it's per certain property and depends on the property you want to preserve. Uh, you have very different algorithms and, 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 and to cut those. But, um, But if in this slide here, I'm showing that. So if we were going to do just random sample, this my core set a one over epsilon squared, um, with with sort of depends on dimension and depends on the log of your probability. But we're going to do it slightly better, I would say, um, more complicated algorithm. Then you have slightly better um, for it. Some, if I remember correctly, there are some other algorithms where you construct epsilon coset set. Um, if you want to sample some initial set, an extra point you add will be say furthest away from your existing samples. Sort of want to have certain sort of uh, good coverage of the domain, but not sure it's a random sample. So it's always um, to correct those um, depends on the size you would like to have and then the property you would like to preserve. So there, um, I, I'm sure if you read um, those two papers, I can send you the um, reference later. If you those papers, there's sort of the uh, references within them will give a good broad. Um, 
I believe um, the guy from IBM is sort of a senior guy. I think maybe at least I will, 10 years ago, a very nice overview of the whole work on Corset. And if I have, I'll send, I'll send it to you. Um, I, my primary kicks in, so I don't remember his name right now. But at um, IBM, um, so it's a tough, I would say. Okay. Okay. So, so, uh, yeah, so those of you without microphones, next time get a microphone. I know Jen told me a while ago she didn't have a microphone. I see her. But I guess she still doesn't have a microphone. So, uh, uh, thanks a lot, uh, thanks a lot, Bay. Uh, so, I'll, everybody, warning, and, and we can thank Bay. So, thanks a lot for a really great talk. Thanks, Bay.